Good morning. Um, man, that's good. I'm excited. Uh, we are in a series going through the book of Daniel together, and um, we're, we're kind of heading into Daniel chapter 4 today. So if you've got your Bibles, you can, or your version app, Bible app, whatever, you can turn to, to Daniel chapter 4. Um, if you're new here, I want to give you a little, little bit of a thumbnail sketch of what's, what's going on. The, the book of Daniel as a, a setting, uh, it, mostly in the city of Babylon in the, these, these first chapters, which is the capital city of the Babylonian Empire. And uh, it's, this was an enormous empire around like 600 BC, so like just a little bit before my time. Um, uh, and I want to actually, if, I think I have a picture of, of, the, of the Babylonian Empire, if you want to put that up there. So this is, um, it's not a great picture, I'm sorry, um, especially because it's so big. But you can see anything that's orange here is Babylon. This is the Babylonian Empire between the years of 606 and 536 BC. Um, just keep it up there for a little bit. Um, this is essentially the most powerful empire in the known world at the time. And uh, as you can see, the, the city of, of Babylon right here is in present day Iraq. Um, that just kind of give you like a thumb, like so that you have a, a visual of, of what it looked like and where all of this was happening. Um, I want to highlight something to you as, as we look at like a historical map. Um, and I put this in your notes that Babylon consists of more than geography. It, it's actually a, a mindset, a mentality. Um, all throughout the Bible, there's this reference of like a, like a demonic mindset that could probably dis, be distilled down to one word, pride. Pride. Um, the Babylon mentality, uh, you, may, you may recognize that word because it's a weird word, Babylon, Babylonian, uh, all the way back to Genesis chapter 11, um, the infamous Tower of Babel, Babylon, Babylonian, Babel, all goes together. Uh, all the way back in Genesis chapter 11, the, the Tower of, of Babel. In verse 4, the, the people of Babylon uh, were saying, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we can make a name for ourselves. Um, from the very beginning, God looks down and he says, this isn't good because unity, even when people are unified for the wrong reasons, is still a dangerous thing, right? It, it's a powerful thing, let's just say that. Uh, and so he confuses their language. They're not able to, to make this tower that they're trying to reach heaven. Um, the reality is, is this Babylonian mentality is that was at work back then in Genesis chapter 11 and at work in the Babylonian empire is at work today. That same idea of, is that Babylon elevates self and degrades God. Like that is how this mentality works. There's nothing new under the sun. And even in our current day today, the elevation of self, of self-importance and pride, and the, well, does God even exist, and degradation of, of God. And we can see how this mentality continues even in recent times of dictators and conquerors that have assumed this same mentality. You may remember a guy by the name of Adolf Hitler, right? Like um, recent dictator, uh, knew this mentality really well, even down to throwing Jews into fiery furnaces. He follows Nebuchadnezzar and, and Babylon's mentality. Um, Saddam Hussein, you may remember him if you're maybe my age or a little bit older. Um, he actually claimed to be the reincarnation of Nebuchadnezzar and vowed and actually began to build and rebuild the ancient city of Babylon. So this, I just want to kind of give you like a, an idea, an understanding that like what we're talking about, Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon and all the things that are going on in Daniel, it's much more than a geographic spot or an empire in a historical map. It's more of a mentality that plays itself out into even our hearts today. Um, 
And so we're going to, if you turn with me to Daniel chapter 4, uh, as we're getting into it, I want you to realize and understand that, that 30 years has passed between Daniel chapter 3 and Daniel chapter 4. So it's a bit of a fast forward. Daniel's no longer this 15-year-old boy with his friends, Rakshak and Benny, who were uh, taken from Jerusalem and then put in, indoctrinated and assimilated to the Babylonian culture. 30, over 30 years has passed since then, and Daniel has risen to power um, as a leader, really. He's seen as numbered, actually, as one of the wise men of Babylon by King Nebuchadnezzar himself. And so um, we find Nebuchadnezzar still suffering from the same terminal disease of pride that, um, that he was suffering from all the way throughout. Because um, what we find is that like, he, he's successful. He, 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 he conquered all of that land. Um, and one of the things that, we've, that we fail to see, even in our current culture, is that success can actually breed pride. Um, defeat can be difficult, but success can be fatal. And it's fatal in a, in a really weird, sadistic way, because winning can convince you of your own good press that you are as amazing as everyone says you are, right? And it causes you to take God off of the throne and to put you on your own throne of your own life, and you do you, because I'm up there now. And all that does when you put yourself on the throne is set you up for, at best, disillusionment and at worst, disappointment, because you are disappointing. Um, and so, you know, that's the reality. Yeah, you put yourself on the throne, and then you disappoint yourself. You're like, yeah, I'm not, I guess I'm not all I'm cracked up to be. And so you either prop it up or you lie to yourself with false humility, or uh, you're just so disillusioned by, you know, um, yeah, narcissism that you, we just kind of keep moving forward, which is kind of what our, our, our current culture pushes. And so the, the reality is this, that we always, and we always worship what we enthrone. And when we, when we choose to enthrone ourselves as the be all end all, and our opinion matters the most, then, uh, then we end up worshiping that which, we, that which we enthrone. And so we watch Nebuchadnezzar on this same roller coaster ride of pride, like you and I do. Um, it's the same, same thing. He's just got more money. And so you see it, like kind of, he, he conquers Jerusalem and all of this land, but he conquers Jerusalem. He's doing an amazing job. He's, he, he's not only like uh, conquering land, but he's assimilating the people into being Babylonians. I mean, he is successful in what he's doing. And then he has a nightmare and he can't figure out what it means. Daniel comes in and interprets his nightmare to him. We find in Daniel chapter one and two, he falls on his face. And he's like, surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings. I mean, he's literally worshiping Yahweh in that moment. And then the very next chapter, he forgets. Because we do. And then he builds a 90-foot statue made out of pure gold of himself. And not only does he worship it and put himself on the throne, he's like, hey, all of you need to, when we do the whole wiki, 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 when, we, when the music sounds, then everyone bows and everyone gets weak in the knees and they bow down except for a few of these guys, Rakshak and Benny, who stay standing. They, they refuse to bow. He gets irate and throws them into a furnace, but they don't get burned. They come out not even smelling like smoke. And, and again, Nebuchadnezzar says this, praise be to your God. He says, no other God saves like yours. I mean, he's like, he's on, he's on his face again. And now we pick up in chapter four, 30 years later, and, and his success has gotten the best of him again. It's important for you to know that, that Nebuchadnezzar actually writes the first chapter or the, the fourth chapter of Daniel in the first person. It's a chapter in the Bible that's pretty much written by uh, this pagan king. Um, it's interesting. And what, I'm going to start reading in verse four of Daniel four. He says this, I... Nebuchadnezzar was at my home, at home in my palace, contented and prosperous. Pause. You probably would be too. Um, his empire, I showed you, is vast. 
he, he owns it all. His, his reign is powerful. People fear him. He's a pretty big deal. He has so much gold left over that he just decides to make statues of himself nine stories tall. Um, his home is a palace. Your house would be his closet. Like it's everything he has is bigger and better than you. In fact, you might not even realize this, but one of the seven wonders of the ancient world is the hanging gardens of Nebuchadnezzar. So he literally builds this mountain and lush, like amazing, like gardens in the middle of a desert, has its own irrigation. It's this, this marvel of the ancient world. And with this backdrop of blessing, um, it's, it's, it, all of a sudden his pride distorts his blessing into an entitlement. And uh, it's when blessings are viewed as entitlements that we tend to make really poor moral decisions. Let me say that again. When our blessings are viewed as entitlements, we tend to make really poor moral decisions. How do I know this? Because we're currently living it out. When our blessings are viewed as entitlements, we make really poor moral decisions. I'll move on. <laughs> Verse 5. All of a sudden, he sa it says, I had a dream, Nebuchadnezzar, I had a dream that made me afraid. As I was lying in my bed, the images and visions that passed through my mind terrified me. So I commanded that all the wise men of Babylon be brought before me to interpret the dream for me. You may be like, wait, didn't this already happen? Kind of, sort of, um, different dream. Same wise guys. Um, so he calls these the wise guys. I call them the wise guys. So the astrologers lay down their pen from writing their horoscope in the weekly you know, newspaper. Um, the magicians come off of their college tour. The, the sorcerers decide to pause their Chinese restaurant fortune cookie company. And they decide, like, they all come before the king uh, to do his bidding. He's like, all of you come. I need all of the wise guys here. And so if I'm completely honest, I don't quite know why uh, they're called wise men. Because as we look throughout the book of Daniel, they really don't do anything wise. Um, they can't really do much uh, of the things that he asks them to do. And I was thinking about this even like fast forward to today. Um, in, in a world gone mad, uh, we tend to view intelligence as wisdom. So we prop up intelligence. If you're really smart, you must be wise. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. Um, even though um, rational, logical reasoning has left the building long ago and wisdom isn't even invited to the party, we tend to build up intelligence, intellectual capabilities, and conflate it with wisdom. They're actually two different things. And so he's like, yeah, calling all these wise guys that... Uh, I don't, like I said, I don't really know why. Um, this is basically Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Let me, let me just, I won't read down through it verse by verse. I'm going to give you like a, just, this is the dream. He dreamt of a big tree, huge, expansive, tall, lush, life-giving. Like things were protected, that like lived under it. Shade and water, all these different, the fruit that came off of it. It was... Uh, it was essentially providing for birds of the air, nested in it. I mean, this was a massive, massive tree in, in, his, in his dream. And then in verse 14, it says, all of a sudden, a loud voice calls from heaven and says this, cut down the tree, whoa, and trim off its branches, strip off its leaves and scatter its fruit. Let the animals flee from under it and the birds from its branches, but let the stump and its roots bound with iron and bronze remain in the ground, in the grass of the field. And then it changes a little bit the next verse. It says, let him be drenched with the dew of heaven and let him live with the animals among the plants of the earth. Let his mind be changed, get this, from that of a man and let him be given the mind of an animal till seven times pass by for him. Very odd dream. Um, so 
None of the wise guys are able to, or maybe they don't want to, interpret the dream. Uh, so they call on Daniel again, because he did the last one, and he's really good, and he's, he's actually maybe the, the wise one out of all the weirdos. And so he, he calls, in, calls him in, and, and essentially Daniel's like, I got bad news for you, Nebuchadnezzar. I got bad news. In verse 22, he says this, your majesty... You are that tree. It's hard to say to the, the king of an empire that could squash you at any moment, right? He throws people in furnaces and you know, conquers lands and people and has no problem with it. He says, you are that tree. Hey, you have become great and strong. Your greatness has grown until it reaches the sky and your dominion extends to distant parts of the earth. And then Daniel interprets the rest of it in verse 25. He says, You will be driven away from people and will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like the ox and be drenched with the dew of heaven. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge, until you acknowledge, until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes. In other words, um, the bad news is you're going to get cut down and it's not going to go well for you. Like, I'm not going to lie, this, you're, you're that tree. Sorry. But in verse 26, it says, the command to leave the stump of the tree with its roots means that your kingdom will be restored to you, catch this, when you acknowledge that heaven rules. When you acknowledge that heaven rules. Um, so he's like, hey, there's bad news, you're going to get cut down. It's not going to go well. Good news is um, God is offering you mercy. Uh, and I put in your notes that restoration can happen when you acknowledge that heaven rules. Restoration can happen when you acknowledge that heaven rules. And then Daniel gives him one final piece of advice, which I think is actually so amazing, even till today. In verse 27, he says, Therefore, your majesty... Please be, he says, be pleased to accept my advice. Renounce your sins by doing what is right and your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed. It may be that you're, then that your prosperity will continue. He's like, there, there may be a way that you could avoid all of this and not have to be cut down to size. He essentially tells Nebuchadnezzar, repent of your sin, turn away from your pride, and do what is right. Which is a great piece of advice. Crazy, like, repent of your sin. You know, you're not God. Uh, and, and he's, turn away from your pride, and do what is right. And... Nebi must have responded with like a head nod or we don't really know. He doesn't really tell us how he received that information from Daniel. Maybe he said, amen, I have no idea. Um, we know he heard it though because he wrote this portion of Daniel chapter four. And the Lord was whispering something to me when I was studying this this week. It's this, pride is a really hard thing to break. Um, and I heard the Lord whisper, pride is never willing to die. You have to kill it. Pride is never willing to die. You, ha you have to kill it. And sure enough, Nebuchadnezzar decides to go on yet another roller coaster ride of pride. Um, and it says in verse 29 that 12 months later, 12 months later, have, you know, he, get, he receives this thing. What was this? Oh my gosh, I freaked out. The car, the, the cut down, the stump was left, all this. And he's like, you're the, you're the tree. Okay, cool, 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 cool. 12 months later, 
as the king was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, he's looking down over everything, probably the hanging gardens, right? And he says, is this not the great Babylon I have built as my royal residence by my mighty power and the glory of my majesty? I mean, like, literally, it's like, dude, you said that? You shouldn't have said that. Like, that's not good. Like, he's like, no, 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 I said it. People probably heard it, right? He's like, he's, it's almost like he's just kind of walking around, just kind of taking in him, right? He's just like, no, nah, enough, enough of me talking about me. What do you think of me, right? Like, just tell me more about me, my majesty, how amazing I am. Um, pride is the difference between a biography and a testimony, both are stories of your life. The difference is who gets the credit. Um, when you give the credit to yourself, that's called a biography. When you give the credit to God, that's called a testimony. The difference is who gets the credit. And it's important for us to understand when we talk about humility, like sometimes there's a, there's a sense of false humility that we, that we think like, well, I can't. I can't ever actually acknowledge my accomplishments. I have to deny anything that I've done is, is really cool or great, or I can't be proud of the things that, like, that, that I've accomplished in my life. You know, like somebody will say something like, oh, wow, I'm just really proud of you. You did a great job. And you're like, oh, pish posh. You know, like, you know, like no, 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 no. Like, it's, it's okay for you to acknowledge the accomplishments of your life. Humility is simply remembering that in all of those accomplishments, you would be a stump without the root that supplies you. Amen. And I think this is kind of the whole point of what it is that God does to Nebuchadnezzar, it's like we can get so enthralled with all the hugeness of all the greatness of us that God sometimes needs to cut us down to the root to remind us that you would be nothing without being connected to the root that supplies everything that you need, that you have, that you are, because we forget. The Word of God says in James chapter 4 that God opposes the proud and, but gives grace to the humble. Which side of that equation would you rather be on? Would you rather have God opposing you, cut you down to size, or would you rather him give you grace? The deciding factor between those two things is whether you choose to humble yourself or not. Because true humility is an act of violence. You have to kill it. Pride doesn't just like give up easily. It is sometimes a, a daily killing. And sometimes, and I will say this, especially, I'll just speak for myself, um, it seems like overkill. Sometimes I feel like, man, this is a little bit too much. Um, I don't, I, I, I struggle with pride, but probably not as much as you guys do. Um, you know, <clears throat> <clears throat> anyway, I pray for you often. Um, the, the title of my message today is uh, a little, just a little off the top, because I was thinking about this and this whole cutting down thing, that, that this dream. Um, every time I go to my barber, uh, his name's Andrew, I sit, I sit down in his chair. He puts, guys will, you guys will understand, like, you sit down in the chair, uh, they put that weird white thing around your neck. I have the cloth. I don't know what that is, paper. And then they, they dress you in a cape. And then they, he asks me the same question. Okay, so uh, what do you want me to do today? Every time. Every time. Your barber asks you the probably exact same thing, right? And um, in that moment, and maybe I'm just not good at adulting, but in that moment, I'm like, I, I'll be honest, guys, I have no idea. I don't know how to communicate how I want him to cut my hair. Like, I, I'm like, I, I've been, getting my, I've been getting my hair cut for my entire life. <laughs> Hundreds of times. Every like six weeks, I'm, I'm there sitting in that chair in the cape, and he asks me the same question, and I, it's always a surprise to me. 
I, I have no idea how to, like, I never took a class in barbering. Like, I don't know the difference between, I don't know terminologies. I don't know, like, he's like, he calls like one, two, threes of like the, 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 the blade guard things. I don't know what, the, I don't know the difference between a one or a three. I'm just like, I, I don't know what a fade is. I, I have no clue what to tell him. And so this is my answer. And some of you guys will probably be able to relate. Most of the time, my answer is something to the effect of this dumb. Um, so kind of, kind of like this. But shorter. <laughs> Come on, anybody? I see the, any guys in here? You're like, I don't know, just, uh, but this, but like take like six weeks of growth off of it. <laughs> just, or, or you just say like simply like, ah, just a little off the top. Yeah. Just take, just take a little off the top. Now, if, if I said just take a little off the top and my barber gets out his, his things, and he just, and he just starts, starts just taking it all off. I would, I would not be happy with Andrew, right? I would be like, I came here for a trim. Came just to take a little off the top, and you made me into a stump, right? I didn't. I didn't want you to remove all my hair. I, I just, I wanted you to just take a little off the top. And I would consider what he did as complete overkill. <laughs> complete overkill. And I think that's probably what Nebuchadnezzar felt when he was cut down. Like, that is a bit of overkill. I'm working on my pride, man. Like... You've heard me, like, you know, when, like, Daniel came and interpreted my dream, I was like, you're a God of God and Lord of kings, hallelujah. And then the guys come out, I throw them in the furnace, sorry about that. But they came out, they were fine, you rescued them, you know, and then I was like, oh my gosh, this God's amazing, and your God is, your God saves like no other God, hallelujah. And, like, he's like, I said all those, I'm working on my pride, like, but, like, I'm kind of a big deal, Kind of a, I don't know if you've seen my hanging gardens. They're in the middle of a desert. Like it doesn't, I'm, I'm, people can do that. I'm a pretty big deal. I, I just need a little, I just need a little off the top. You don't need to cut me down to a stump. I just, I just need a little haircut. Just lower my ears, right? Like that's all I need now. Verse 31. Even as these words are on his lips, he's like, oh, look at what I've done. Look at my majesty and what I've done with my power and all these things. Even as the words were on his lips, a voice came from heaven. He's like, oh, no. This is what is decreed for you, King Nebuchadnezzar. Your royal authority has been taken from you. You will be driven away from people and will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like the ox. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge, until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes. And immediately, talk about like immediately, What had been said about Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. He was driven away from people, ate grass like the ox. His body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair grew like the feathers of an eagle and his nails like the claws of a bird. Okay. When God warns us about something, we tend to think that we have a lot more time than we actually do, right? I mean, like, okay, yeah. I mean, God's talked to me about that. I was like, last week I was praying, and God, you know, I got to deal with that. I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. I know, like, it's something that I'm working on. <laughs> like, it's just it's a little off the top. That's fine, right? Like, but Nebuchadnezzar's day came when God had given him so many chances that he was like, enough. You've ignored too many pieces of my advice. You've given lip service, but you've meant none of it. Enough. And we oftentimes mistake God's patience for his condoning of our actions. 
Like, you know, I mean, I know he talked to me about it, but like he's, he hasn't done anything about it. So it. Must be he's okay with it. Just kind of like turning a blind eye to it. We're good, right? I'm, I'm, I, I, you know, I'm doing some things for him on the side. I know I'm not dealing with the thing that he's asked me to, but oftentimes we mistake God's patience for him condoning of our actions. Um, I think that Nebuchadnezzar was just as surprised as you and I are at what happened to him. And if you've ever been cut down to size, you know it's humiliating, isn't it? Like, I don't know if if you've ever walked through a season of life where you feel like literally God has just cut you down to size. And maybe it's it's not been the Lord. Maybe you've just walked through a circumstance that is absolutely humiliating. I mean, Nebuchadnezzar lost his sanity for a time. When 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 you fail to acknowledge your sin and you fail to take yourself off the throne and put God on it, what happens is that you untether yourself from that which is the anchor to your soul and you're left adrift and directionless. And so when we wonder like, well, what's going on? What's going on with our world? What's going on with people? What's going on with our culture? All this. When, when we fail to acknowledge our sin and take ourself off of the throne and pull down our pride and put him back up onto it, we, in essence, are untethering ourselves from the anchor to our souls and we're left adrift and directionless And you do you, and you do you, and we all do we, and we're wondering what in the world is going on. And so we look at Nebuchadnezzar, he isolates himself, he stops taking care of himself, his hair grows out so long, and I mean, that sounds kind of disgusting, but it like turns into like a matted thing, like talk about needing a little off the top, like he, uh, like like almost it says it looks like eagle's feathers. Um, And it actually seems that Nebuchadnezzar believed that he was a cow, so he starts eating grass like a cow. Must have been utterly humiliating. Come on, come on, that was good, that was good. That one was free, I won't even charge for that one. That's a good one, thank you. <laughs> yes, you're quick, you guys are quick. All right, again, what precipitated all of this? Pride, pride. Pride turned an angel into the devil. Pride turned a king into a beast. What does pride do to to you and I? Pride never makes you a better human. It actually degrades your humanity. It's almost like God is saying, because you insisted on trying to become more than what I made you, you will now become less than what I made you. Because you were unwilling to, 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 to kill your pride, because you were unwilling to take yourself off of the throne and put me back on my rightful place, because you were so insistent on trying to become more than what I made you, then now you will become less than what I made you. Go eat some grass in your front yard. Yikes. Pride puts up a facade of success. The problem with pride is that You can be successful, but it literally actually sucks the joy out of your life. Why? Because pride has the inability to be thankful. It just, all it knows is entitlement. All it knows is entitlement. It takes no pleasure in having things. It only takes pleasure in having more of something than the person next to you. So if things are going well, you think to yourself, well, it's about time. I deserve it. And if things go badly, you think this isn't fair, don't you? Yeah, come on. (laughs) Pride destroys your ability to handle times of suffering, and it takes the joy out of times of plenty. And it's really hard to see in yourself. And it's really easy to see in everyone else. I mean, you all know people that are prideful. They're right right next to you. (laughs) Right there. C.S. Lewis wrote this so much better than I could have said it. He wrote, the more pride we have, the more other people's pride irritates us. Each person's pride is in competition with everyone else's pride. Mm. (laughs) 
What I want to leave you today is this. What was pride's cure? How did Nebuchadnezzar get his sanity back? Verse 34. It says, at the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, this is the key, raised my eyes toward heaven and my sanity was restored. The first thing he did was he raised his eyes toward heaven. And it says at the end of that time, which how long did this last? How long was he eating the grass in his front lawn? Like how long was he growing out his hair? How long did it take to get his nails to look like talons? Like how long did this happen? And the dream said that something about like seven times will pass by you. I read it a little bit earlier. Like he talked about seven times will pass by. Many, many scholars believe that it was seven years of just this insanity that he walked through. Um, I, think, I think more significantly is just the number seven. I, I think there's probably a reason why it doesn't say seven years. It's just seven times will pass by you. Why? Because uh, the number seven, biblically speaking, is the biblical number for fullness or finished. It's kind of the Bible's way of saying that it lasted however long it took. Like however long it took for Nebuchadnezzar to finally look up and acknowledge and acknowledge that God was God and he was not. So how long did it take? However long it took. Many times God will put us into a humbling experience only to get us to look up and to turn back to him. Um, if it wasn't for the pigsty... I don't think that the prodigal son would have looked up and returned home. If it wasn't for being swallowed by a fish, I kind of wonder if Jonah would have ever looked up and returned to Nineveh. There are times and seasons in our own lives where, where God chooses to humble us, to cut us down to size. And the point is this, they aren't meant to punish you. They aren't meant to destroy you. They're meant to restore you. It's for, it's for your own good. It hurts. And it's like, why would you, why? What, what in the world? What, what are you going to get out of this? He's like, no, 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 no. You have, have no idea. Like, I'm cutting you down to size so that you can grow. Nebuchadnezzar goes from looking down and look at all the things that I rule and that I've done and my majesty. And he finally decides to look up and proclaim that heaven rules because as long as you're looking down, you cannot see anything that is above you. And he finally looks up and he's like, okay, I give up. I give up, fine. You win. You win. I told this, uh, I, was, I wasn't planning on sharing this, but I talk, talked about this at uh, our uh, night of uh, prayer and worship. There's a, a young man that went to go visit a, um, an old monk and uh, his, in his later years, and he said, he, he just had an opportunity to interview this guy, and he said, got together with him, he says, hey, do you, uh, do you, do you wrestle, still wrestle with the devil? And he goes, oh. The old man said, no, I, I don't, I, I'm too old for that. He says, I wrestle with God. And the young man said, you what? You wrestle with God and hope to win? And the old man said, oh no, I hope to lose. I hope to lose. When we talk about pride, it is the struggle of who is going to win this. My prayer is, in your struggle with God, you hope to lose. I hope you lose. I hope you lose, because in losing, you win. Amen? Amen. 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 Verse 34, I'll keep going. He says, therefore, he says, then I praised the Most High. I honored and glorified him who lives forever. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. The second thing he does is he chooses to exalt the king of heaven. He makes a distinction between the temporary kingdom that he's all in, all this, this empire, this kingdom of this world, and he compares it to this everlasting kingdom of God. 
And this is a little difficult for us to grasp. And I'm going to just kind of like, like fast forward into our current American democracy that we live in. Because when we talk about these kings and kingdoms and all of this, time, we're, it's kind of like this, uh, we, do, we, don't, we don't know what quite box to put this in because here in America, we live in a democracy. We the people, for the people, by the people, right? So in other words, my opinion matters and my vote counts. Your opinion matters and your vote counts. I hope you do vote. I hope you do speak. I hope you have the freedoms of speech and all of these freedoms that are afforded for you in, uh, in, in America. But as Christians, you are a citizen of a kingdom of which you are not the king. This is going to like, for some of you libertarians in here. Um, in a... <laughs> In a kingdom, in a, just, just fast forward with me now. In a kingdom, the only opinion that matters is the king's. In fact, in a kingdom, do you know this? A, kingdom, a king doesn't actually have an opinion. You know what they call it? His will. So there's no, like, like it really doesn't matter. Like, they're not like, oh, well, that's your opinion. No, no, that's my will and it shall be done. That's, that's kind of how a kingdom works. Um, in old times and in the kingdom of, of heaven. Tim Keller wrote this, if, if your God never disagrees with you, you might just be worshiping an idealized version of yourself. Which is why our prayer as citizens of a kingdom is not, not my will be done, but yours. Your will be done as, on earth as it is in heaven. Like, that's my job that your will would be done. And so when people will come to me and they'll ask me um, what my opinion is about something that is clearly spelled out in the word of God, my answer oftentimes is what makes you think that my opinion matters? Like God's will trumps my opinion. It really doesn't matter how I feel about it. Mm, I can feel it in here. Because it, ri- it, here's the thing though, because it rides up against our pride. That's what you're feeling right now. You're like, who is God to tell me that he's God? He's God. How dare him try to usurp me? I know. That is the struggle, and I hope you lose. Verse 36. At the same time my sanity was restored, my honor and splendor were returned to me for the glory of my kingdom, My advisors and nobles sought me out, and I was restored to my throne and became even greater than before. He recognized that what he thought he was the author of was actually a gift. Um, Pride is actually a form of cosmic plagiarism, claiming that that what you think you're the author of is actually a gift. Pride says, I did this. Um, I worked harder than the guy next to me. I'm a self-made person. I actually deserve this. Humility says, how blessed am I? Like, I can never, I'm not smart. I am not the smartest person in the room. I, I, I never could have made this happen on my own. All the glory goes to God. Like, I don't deserve this. And don't forget, like when God, like he cut down the tree in the dream, but he didn't uproot it, which means he left the stump and he left the roots. And there are times, folks, where God will prune you and it can hurt. And it's not a little off the top. Sometimes he's like, shunk. And you're like, excuse me? Excuse me? I just wanted a little bit off the top. And he's like, you kind of needed more. Maybe so much that you just feel, and maybe even right now, you feel like you had just been cut down. But he always leaves the roots so that you can grow, so that you can produce healthy fruit, because really, to bring you to the realization that you need him. And all of this, I don't need God, I don't need God, I don't need God, really? Well, where are you getting all of your nutrients? Where are you getting the breath that you have? Oh yeah, it is coming from down there, isn't it? It's not coming from up here. I need him. Verse 37, now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the king of heaven because everything he does is right and all his ways are just. Now that is a hard thing to say. He acknowledged that God does everything right and his ways are just. Here's a really, I'm going to leave you with something. 
a really, it's a hard truth that you don't want to hear, but you need to hear. When God sifts you, it means that there is something in you that needs sifting. He's not trying to destroy you or punish you. He's wanting to restore you. So if you're going through a time of sifting, just know it's for a reason. There's something in you that God is wanting to sift. And the longer that you choose to walk in pride, the longer the season of sifting will go. I said earlier that, you know, pride is never willing to die. You've got to kill it. Amen? Why don't you stand with me? The last thing that Nebuchadnezzar did, and it kind of sums everything up, is that he chose to humble himself rather than continue to be humiliated. The longer I live, the the more I find this to be true, that in life, you will either be humbled or humiliated. It's your choice. It's your choice. One of them you initiate yourself, and the other comes whether you like it or not. Circumstances can humiliate you, but only you can humble yourself. Only you can choose to clothe yourself in humility. Let me remind you of a scripture. Philippians 2 verse 10 says, At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess, acknowledge that Christ Jesus is Lord. So whether you make the decision or not, your knees will bend and your tongue will confess. It's a prophetic warning for us. Um, This is God speaking. Isaiah 66 verse 2 says, Has not my hand made all these things? This is God. So that they came into being, declares the Lord. These are the ones I look on with favor, those who are humble and contrite in spirit, and who tremble at my word. In God's economy, the way up is down. The question isn't how high you can climb, it's how low you can go. The point of life is not to build the biggest castle and put yourself as the king. The point of life is to build the kingdom of God and place him on the throne. So as we enter into this last worship song, I wonder if God is stirring something on the inside of you. Maybe you're going through a time of sifting. Maybe you're going through a time where you just feel cut down. Like you were okay with a little off the top and you feel like God has just pruned you and it hurts. It's a little bit too much. I just, I pray, Lord Jesus, that in the midst of our days, as we, as we go through and try to follow you to the best of our ability, Lord, that we would choose to take ourselves off the throne and put you in your rightful place. Lord, I pray for those that are in a place of sifting, in a place of just feeling pruned and trimmed and all of those things that, that, go, that go on in life. Lord, I pray that, that we would respond that we wouldn't allow our own pride to steal our own joy or allow our own pride to not allow us to go through times of suffering, knowing that on the other end of it is much greater joy than we could ever imagine. So Lord, we lift you up. We lift you high. We, we realize that there is a age-old wrestling match. You versus me. You versus me. And many times, I think I've got the upper hand. Many times, I think I have the advantage, Lord. But the older I get, the more I can concur with that old monk. No. I hope I lose. So Jesus, humble us. More than that, Lord, may we choose to kill our own pride and humble ourselves before you. So church, maybe as it's during this last song, whatever you feel like God's urging you to do, maybe you want to come up here at the front or just find in your seat or whatever, I, I just encourage you to just make some space, make some space, but respond to the word of God and say, Lord, I'm, I'm unwilling to
to continue in the path that I'm currently in. I, I release this over to you. I pray, help me to kill the pride, this wrestling match. I give up, I surrender. I hope I lose. In Jesus' name.